So I think we can get started. Welcome. Um, thanks for joining us for the first part of a three-part Lunch and Learn series we're doing uh, this summer on transfer pathways. Um, I'm Meryl Barado, Knowledge Mobilization Specialist at ONCAT, and today we'll be discussing what pathways are, why they're helpful for transfer students, and what we mean by the idea of in-demand pathways. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are joining you today from land within the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. I would also like to acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, I encourage all of you to tell us where you're joining us from today in the traditional territory that you're occupying um, in the chat. There we go. Um, I'd also like to highlight that while land acknowledgement is important, work to reconcile with Indigenous communities must move beyond this. As an organization focused on creating a seamless transfer system in Ontario, it is a priority for us to continue our work collaborating with Indigenous institutional partners and specifically consider how to make transfer work for Indigenous students who face additional barriers to post-secondary education and transfer as a result of the ongoing harms of colonization. Okay, and with that, I'd like to introduce my colleagues who will be sharing their insights with us today. Um, joining us is Rod Misagian. He's the senior researcher at ONCAT and has been with the organization since 2019. Rod is also an Ontario certified teacher and holds a PhD in the sociology of education from the University of Waterloo, where his work focused on student post-secondary decision-making. We're also joined by Anna Skinner, the manager of funding programs at ONCAT, who supports strategies that improve outcomes for transfer students in the post-secondary education system in Ontario. She has extensive experience in participatory grant making, designing funding programs that foster youth leadership, social inclusion, and accessible post-secondary education. Anna holds an MA in geography where her research explored strategies for promoting health and wellness among frontline community organizers. Welcome both. I'm really excited for your presentation. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen for you. <clears throat> I can find it. There we go. <laughs> okay, and I'll hand it over to you. Oops, sorry about that. Hey. Thanks, Meryl. Um, I think Rod and I are happy to be here with all of you today. And I think in the next kind of 10 minutes or so, uh, we really just want to share some of uh, the ways in which ONCAT has been kind of um, looking at who are transfer students, why are pathways important, and then we'll share a bit about, you know, from, I think, our experiences often funding and supporting pathway development, as well as research on kind of student mobility, some of the really, like, the considerations for developing pathways. Um, and then I think, as Meryl highlighted at the beginning, this is kind of part one of a series. So there'll be, uh, after today, opportunities where you'll get to go deeper with folks really working in the field on pathway development, who I think can, uh, uh, yeah, really get you into the kind of how to and best practices and approaches. Uh, so again, thank you for joining us and I will hand it off to Rod to kick this off. Sorry, I had myself on mute. Thanks, Anna. Uh, so if we could just go to the next slide. I think a Anna introduced this nicely. It's kind of a high level discussion about transfer students pathways and in-demand pathways for those of you that are new and entering the field and for those of you that have also been in the field for a while should be useful so i think any discussion about pathways and in-demand pathways should start with understanding who transfer students are because after all we're creating these pathways to serve students and i think it's useful when we're talking about transfer students to understand that there is a journey uh, and there are steps involved in the process. And that journey can be complex because as we know, uh, our PSE, our PSE uh, system in Ontario includes many institutions and every institution uh, doesn't necessarily 
process applications and deal with transfer students in the same way. So that journey can look different depending on where a student is moving towards. And we can think about uh, transfer itself broadly. We can think of it as the movement from one institution to another. And sometimes that movement and mo switching programs or switching institutions isn't necessarily accompanied by uh, receiving any transfer credit necessarily. But here's a typical sort of graphic that might help us think about the different steps that are involved in that journey. Obviously, when we're talking about a student that wants to move, uh, there's a point where they're thinking about that decision. Uh, so you can think of that as transfer intent. And of course, they have to weigh their options. There is a decision-making process involved uh, and an application process. And sometimes where it gets tricky is whether the, the, at the point where they're actually applying to institutions, depending on the institution that they're applying to, they could have a sense of which formal credits that they've taken at their institution would be uh, accepted by the receiving institution at the point of application. But sometimes that might happen after they've accepted an offer and enrolled. So depending on that, those, those can happen simultaneously sometimes, just depending on the institution that we're talking about. And I think when we're talking about pathways, the whole point of it is to provide a system, to develop a system and a process that where students can be awarded credit for prior learning. Uh, so that's the goal, and hopefully they'll earn credits. And as we know, that can help really bolster uh, their bolster their journey, their time to completion. Uh, you know, we have reports where we've talked about the relationship between the average number of credits awarded and completion rates and times. And that's the goal, obviously. Any student that enters their post-secondary journey wants to graduate uh, and enter the labor market. Great, if we can go to the next slide, please. So yeah, transfer students, transfer pathways, the journey, I think is also, uh, I think the tricky part is, is that when we think in conventional terms about credit transfer, we're thinking about the transfer of formal credit that's taken at an Ontario college, university or indigenous institute, uh, sort of, and that students would be taking those credits with them to their new institution. But there's other ways of thinking about this, and I just wanted to highlight a few of them. Uh, one of them is the transfer of prior learning. Uh, so for those of you that are new to the field or have been in transfer for a while, you, you've encountered this. It's, it's in many institutions, particularly the colleges, uh, assess prior learning through Pilar. So that's the prior learning assessment and recognition. And those can be work experiences, life experiences, uh, volunteer experiences that happen outside of formal learning within institutions. And that is also a type of transfer, but except you're not transferring formal learning taken through a course, but you're transferring those experiences. So I wanted to share that point with you as well. Again, when we're thinking about transfer, sometimes the words transfer and mobility uh, get lumped together. And sometimes in certain cases, they can be interchangeable. But one way of looking at it is that mobility is just the movement from one institution to another without the granting of credits. Uh, and mobility can happen within the province or it can happen between provinces. So students can be moving institutions, uh, to moving to institutions outside of Ontario or within Ontario. And another nuance is thinking about international students. Uh, so students that have overseas experience taking their learning and coming into institutions in Ontario. And sometimes what, something that often gets tricky, even for myself, is understanding how transfer applies to students who have completed a credential. Let's say, for example, they've completed a bachelor's degree and they want to apply and get accepted into a graduate certificate at the college level or a diploma program. Uh, you know, we could consider that transfer, but where it gets tricky is that sometimes the prerequisites for entry to those programs is just the credential itself. So whether or not we have to consider whether or not a, a student is receiving any credit for their prior degree when they're entering these types of programs. Uh, and that's another consideration when we're thinking about transfer students and transfer in general. So here's a kind of conventional working definition of a transfer pathway. So we've talked about transfer students. We've talked about the different ways that we can conceptualize transfer. So transfer pathway, a defined route 
from one program or in, a program or institution to another program or institution that specifies eligibility requirements and how transfer credits will be accepted and applied at the receiving institution. So again, we see some of the things that I talked about earlier. It's that idea that a pathway is movement. A pathway can be characterized by movement from one institution to another or a program. And then we're building the whole transfer into the, when we build in transfer into the definition, we could think about it in terms of credits that are being transferred. Uh, and I think an important caveat is that sometimes movement and mobility can happen through informal, informal, informal channels as well, excuse me, self-navigated pathways. So in other words, it, a student could potentially just switch institutions and then, you know, after a year, figure out that they may be eligible for transfer credit. Um, so it's kind of, again, going back to that life, si life, life cycle. Uh, diagram at the beginning. All of these things are interconnected when we think about transfer. The timing, uh, whether we're talking about formalized credit, uh, whether we're just talking about movement without formalized, without the receiving of formalized credits, these are all the things that we at ONCAT consider and through our discussions with you all and our stakeholders, uh, we, we, you know, we're, we're learning as we go and uh, this is just one way of defining it. Hey, Anna. Great. So, I mean, I think broadly, as we kind of think about pathways and why pathways, it really does go back to a system and creating a system that is best supporting students and recognizing that transfer students are really diverse populations of students. Um, you know, whether we're looking at transfer students as often being mature students, having obviously prior post-secondary, uh, perhaps first generations in their family to attend post-secondary, um, representing different uh, communities and populations that are not necessarily um, overly represented in post-secondary. So when we think about transfer students, it's not just the they happen to be moving institutions, it's that there's a lot going on in students' lives. Um, and we're really looking at how do we ensure that students can move in a way that doesn't overly rely, if we go to that idea of like the more informal way, their own self-advocacy and, and sorting out how they move from one institution to another that again, relies on them to sort out everything uh, and advocate for courses. And, you know, we, we just, we hear all the, the challenges around kind of documents around even understanding they can apply for transfer credits. And so uh, when we think about why pathways are important, it's an opportunity to ensure that students aren't losing credits um, and because that has the uh, impact if it can increase the time it takes for them to complete their credentials, it can increase costs. And I think as Rod has kind of shared, um, certainly with us, the longer students are in an institution, the less likely they are to graduate. And so when we think about the importance of like um, recognizing this prior learning, it can have real benefits in terms of like student outcomes. Uh, we don't want cases where students are having to repeat learning um, and finding that out once they've already started taking courses. So again, we hear examples of students who find out way later that they could have been exempt from a course. Um, and then looking at it, students having inconsistent experiences compared to other students at their institutions or other transfer students attending different institutions. And so when we think about pathways and, and moving with these more formal strategies, um, it's a way to just ensure that students receive credits for their previous learning, um, but also that we're getting to a more consistent practice across the sector. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, so when we think about pathways, again, this can really look at the formal agreements between institutions bilateral or multilateral agreements. Um, it can also include how institutions develop their own, we call them kind of policy pathways around how they're going to just assess consistently students transferring in. So things like block transfer agreements and others. So uh, a pathway isn't just one type of agreement. Um, it's kind of that intentional strategy used by institutions and multiple institutions to uh, make it easier for students to kind of move kind of courses and programs with them. Thanks, Anna. So yeah, in-demand pathways. Uh, this is another 
important consideration. Uh, it's another type of pathway uh, that we talk about. And again, like everything else that we've discussed, it's nuanced and can be complex. But at a high level, uh, these are pathways that respond to student interests. Because after all, we're doing this for students and connects with opportunities that can address regional or labor market needs. And if you're thinking about it in terms of, of an institutional research perspective and collecting information, we could think of it in terms of enrollment data. So which are the programs that students are applying to in larger numbers? Uh, so we could think about demand as characterized by high student interest and uh, related to high enrollment in a particular pathway and particular courses and programs. But I think it can be and it is more nuanced than more nuanced than that, because when we're talking about students, but we're also talking about institutions and regions and institutions have different needs. They have different student populations. And so they may create programs that address certain uh, student populations. Uh, it could be underrepresented students and they could be developing programs or ideas that it, work outside of just strictly thinking about enrollment numbers. And that context matters. And that context is also related to uh, the provincial, provincial considerations. So coming from the ministry, uh, it could be something that has to do with the strategic uh, mandates, the strategic mandate agreements at each institution, what are their priorities. It could be contextual in the case of something like COVID, uh, and we've all seen how COVID can influence decision-making at the institutions and drive interest in certain programs like uh, PSW programs, social service programs, nursing programs, because there's a need for healthcare workers uh, at a given moment. And so I think those three things, high student interest, the fact that th that interest is contextual and not only driven by numbers, but other considerations, uh, and that it's a it, it's a working process. So uh, it has to do with all of these moving parts. And I think that's one way of looking at this concept of demand as a multifaceted concept. Okay. Great. And I think that's something, again, we really emphasize in this uh, approach around in demand, that it, it isn't exclusively measuring, you know, enrollment counts at your institution, but really thinking about how pathways can support different populations of students um, to achieve post-secondary success and to enter jobs and labor market in areas that they're passionate about and also support kind of economic and social well-being. Um, so again, this idea of it being multifaceted and you'll see it, you know, if you're ever working on pathway projects with ONCAP that um, we really do work with institutions with regions to identify what are what's going on in your region what's going on with different populations of students uh, that can be better served by formal pathway agreements um, so yeah as we say it's really about how do we meet transfer student needs knowing there are um, often students are at a disadvantage when it comes to navigating the post-secondary system and what information is out there and so um, one of the things and if we move on to the next slide is that in our work with supporting pathways, um, it, which again is very kind of practically working with institutions in Ontario to uh, develop new pathways or scale successful pathways. Um, there's some important considerations that we kind of ask anyone to really think about when it comes to uh, why develop a pathway. So the first piece is, um, is there a need or a demand for the pathway? And I think as we've articulated, like demand will include clear students are going to benefit, um, but also other types of demand. And so um, we've developed uh, several strategies to work with institutions in ways to really be able to assess their institutional data and to take stock of transfer student flows at the institution. So that's a really important kind of place to start if you're trying to understand if there's a demand for a particular pathway is how have students been entering or leaving your institution? And um, looking at labor market opportunities, 
looking at priorities for underrepresented learners and, and how your institution is situated to support post-secondary success for different populations, that these can all factor into understanding if there's an actual need for pathways. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, we just really do recognize that to develop pathways is a highly collaborative, often involves multiple institutions, um, but also involves multiple stakeholders within an institution. And so um, as kind of folks identify there's a clear need for pathway in a given area or field of study, um, there's then considerations around, okay, well, will it be viable to develop a pathway? And so these are the things that um, I'll kind of flag because it's not always the case. Sometimes there's a clear need, but you know, are, are there confirmed partnerships among the participating institutions? So that's something that we'd say is important to put time into is just actually getting other you know, institutions to the table. Uh, are there within an institution uh, different folks who are going to really help guide the process, you know, champion the process? Because we do know that transfer students and pathways often involve people championing it. It's not top priority for uh, institutions. Involving subject matter experts. So have faculty or different subject matter experts um, before going fully down the path of trying to develop a full-fledged pathway, have they reviewed any of the kind of adjoining curriculum to say there's enough alignment to even consider it? Because we've certainly seen cases where, you know, 80% of the work went into, trying to kind of create a pathway only to have um, different subject matter experts say there isn't enough alignment. Um, so trying to catch that earlier in the kind of exploration stage is something we kind of highly recommend. Also looking at accreditation considerations because depending on the pathways and fields of study, there's you know just things to understand if you're developing pathways in engineering fields or social work, like there's accreditation bodies that can really impact the viability of a pathway. Um, and then there's also just internal priorities and policies at the institution. So just making sure this is something that uh, you know we've heard of cases where there was a pathway being developed, but then there was a new program being developed at an institution that it was perceived to be competition with the pathway. So there wasn't really a lot of internal buy-in. So again, we just recognize that in developing pathways, there's a lot of this internal um, work needed to kind of uh, check out what's going on in other areas of the institution and making sure there's going to be support for it. Um, and then something that I think is really important, but isn't always top of mind when thinking about pathways. So pathways are in some ways trying to help the student get into the institution with the most amount of kind of prior learning credits recognized, but really thinking about, well, once they're there, have folks been engaged who are going to be able to support them throughout the rest of their post-secondary journey? So looking at supporting transfer student success, or are there wraparound supports that are needed or other student services that could be brought in to really ensure that that student who's coming in or a you know, bulk of students at a different point than direct entry are going to receive supports along their journey to ultimately achieve kind of completion and success. So these are just some of the considerations and um, we certainly, I think part of it is just to say, while transfer and in-demand is multifaceted, we also recognize there's a lot of moving pieces within an institution and also between institutions that um, need to be considered and actually resulting in that articulation agreement or institutional policy uh, that benefits transfer students. So we're not under any impression that it's straightforward or doesn't require a lot of, um, yeah, just a lot of work and a lot of um, kind of, you know, we, we support all of you as champions for this work. Uh, and yeah, so just to say that these are the things that we would certainly flag in trying to develop a successful pathway. Um, so that's kind of like, you know, our overall kind of, you know, just like quick spotlight on transfer students, why pathways and in demand. And then we really did want to open it up um, for some discussion with all of you. Um, and then at the end, we'll kind of plug a few upcoming events and funding opportunities. But I, yeah, I think here would be a nice chance to kind of pause. So one, if there's questions or areas of discussion, and I know I certainly have a question to all of you attending, which is we've shared some examples of why pathways matter, but we're really interested in hearing from all of you in the field. Where are you seeing examples of, um, you know, is there, are there things you would add to the, the case for pathways? 
Uh, thanks so much, Anna and Rod. Really excellent presentation. Um, so yeah, please feel free to type any questions you have in the chat or just raise your hand and go for it. Should I stop sharing my screen? Would that be okay? Yeah, you can reshare when we want to signal sure. some of the upcoming okay. events. Yeah. I do, I have some questions, but I know you also had <laughs> some as well. So did you want to ask? Well, I think for on on mind, it is really if anyone wants to share like examples, are there things you would add to the case for pathways. So why pathways matter that maybe it, as we were walking through, um, got you thinking about, you know, how you're seeing it benefit students in your own institutional context or in the communities you're working in. Hillary, yes, please. Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> you can always <laughs> count on me to talk. Um, I think for us, it's just um, efficiency is the biggest thing that comes to mind um, in the case for pathways is that these students are coming to us anyway, um, and we're going to have to do the transfer credit assessment anyway. So the formalization process is really, um, it benefits them, obviously, because they're able to plan degree completion and um, and you know, make decisions about where they're going to study, um, but it also helps the institutions in terms of being able to advise a lot easier um, and being able to give transfer uh, credits a lot easier. So um, for us, it's just like a, it's way more efficient to have a pathway than it is to, um, to do transfer credit on a case by case basis. That's a great point. David, please go ahead. Hi. <laughs> so uh, from our perspective, it's planning. So I can work with a high school student guidance counselor mm -hmm. and plan pretty much their post-secondary life cycle from college to university to grad school, or even from university back to college. So it gives that ability to point to a document to say, you can do this versus kind of like this vague notion of transfer, not really, I don't want to use the word guarantee, and we all know the word guarantee is very bad, uh, the, the, the notion of you can kind of do this, but I really don't have anything to point to. Thanks for that. Um... Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned going into high schools because I think not everyone is necessarily doing that. So it's it's even more reason, I think, to like have a pathway in place because you can, I think Rod had shared um, an article from the CDC recently that was talking about how uh, starting in high school may even be too late for some students to even think about post-secondary. So the earlier we can give them a sense that there are options for them in post-secondary and they may not always be the traditional ones that everyone uh, is aware of is, is wonderful. I think that comment is coming from Andrew. No, it's from me. Oh, sorry, Sienna, <laughs> okay. Did you wanna read it or? As I just shoved some lunch in my mouth, sure, why not? That's the lunch and learn, right? Yeah. So I, I wrote that um, to further David's comment. Everyone wants something in writing. To, it doesn't guarantee it, but it like, makes it a little bit more concrete. And so even when we're working with something like institution, um, institution policy pathways, which are the receiving institution creating their own pathway, which is not necessarily a formalized agreement between two institutions and not written down on paper, that ontransfer.ca is a great space to point students to and or guidance counselors and or parents who are looking for something a little bit more concrete and in writing. And you know, when it's online, it's, it's absolutely factual, um, <laughs> joking. 
but um, it's a great place for, for the student to get a reference point uh, when they're looking for something uh, and a little bit more details in, into something from an advising standpoint. That's great, thanks. And I see there's a question um, oh, yes. Sorry. around, yeah, uh, and I think kind of Rod and I, maybe we can uh, take a first go and again, then invite others, but really looking at impacts of pathways and how they might benefit students. And I, again, thinking in broad strokes, um, I certainly see how pathways can be a real like time saver for students. So, uh, you know, in terms of enabling a student, whether we're we're looking at you know this idea of like a two plus two or a three plus two kind of agreement for college university transfer um, that within that four or five year window of time a student is able to achieve two credentials um, so there's that kind of time savings um, I think sometimes we also look at it and go the cost savings but also the potential missed opportunity so if students do end up taking courses that they didn't need to take how could they have spent that time differently? Would it have enabled them to work? Would it have enabled them, you know, again, looking at this idea of transfer students as a very diverse population to be able to focus in on other aspects of their lives. And so I think really the importance around just saving students as much time and, and money in pursuing their post-secondary as possible. Uh, and then the other avenue I often see is it as a pathways as an on-ramp into credentials that maybe weren't accessible to the student at the point they were leaving high school or entering post-secondary perhaps it's because of the courses they took in high school they didn't have the the right prerequisites but also life so um you know we're working on some really interesting pathways you know one in particular that's supporting advanced um kind of diploma holders and engineering technology to enter kind of an engineering degree in a five-year window so three years at a college two years at a university and and end up with a kind of an engineering accredited degree and so it's this kind of on ramp into credentials that maybe at the point a, a student was first starting wouldn't have been possible again be it like limitations on courses but also life age and stage and so i think we see a lot of benefits there in terms of um, access and post-secondary How much time do we have left? Uh, we have until 12.55 before I wrap up. So okay. um, I see Risha has her hand up. So please go ahead, Risha. Yes. Um, so two things. Um, I actually just had an advising. Sorry, two things. I just had an advising appointment this morning with a student who's looking to transfer from one grad certificate in the college system to one of ours. And he was extremely frustrated because initially in the past he had actually done a pathway and for him he expected the the process of moving from a from a, a grad certificate from one institution to another to be similar to his pathway experience where everything was done for him up front where he just sort of came in and just got started in the degree um, he got a scholarship and it was all sort of pre-planned for him and he was very um um, well upset in some in some instances but also just like he couldn't believe it like he's like how do you do this like this is so complicated like this is so it, like he's like this is terrible and I'm doing this not just for your institution but for like two others because I'm applying to three different places and I have to go through all of this all of this <laughs> so I like I could understand his frustration but like that's like just this morning that's just like a great um sense of like how important pathways are um, when it comes to making it easy for students. Like it's it's already set out, it's already done. They don't have to go through this back and forth finding course outlines, finding their trans their their um you know finding their transcripts. Like it's already done and it's it's done for them and they can just focus on getting started and and sort of being successful. A second piece um, when it comes to advising students is uh, when there's a pathway, for example, diploma to degree, um, it allows students to sometimes test things out. So for example, um, I've known students who wanted to take a degree, but they weren't 100% sure that this is the field that is for them. And if, for example, they, they 
they, they come out of the, the program or they drop out of the program one or two years into the degree, they have nothing, right? They don't have something tangible that they can sort of use to, to go and say, find a job, for example. So by having these pathways, a student might choose to maybe start in a diploma program to get a sense of if this field is exactly what they want to do then move into a degree and it could be the same degree or it could be something completely different because they now have that that credential and can use it to apply for something similar or apply to something that is dissimilar to what they've initially thought they would like to do so it gives students and i think parents as well that um, knowledge that okay it's a one to two years or one year or two years and then I, there's choices after i can move move and i can move you know, because sometimes I love this, but that might change. So I can move where I want to, or if I want to change, that change can happen. So you're not sort of um, locked in um, for a long period of time in something you might not be sure it's for you. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Uh, two points, actually. Thank you for give, sharing that experience that you had with the student and also, uh, yeah, the latter point. Um, Rod, I just, there's one question in the chat about if ONCAT has any resources to help gauge labor market demand. Um, I know you had used Stats Canada data in the past, but I wasn't sure if there was anything else you would recommend that we've done. Um, yeah. Sienna also told us that we have on on transfers working on something like that. So it depends, like we can talk offline, Hillary, but um, if you want, to know what, for example, what the industry perceptions are regarding high skill, uh, high demand skills that they're looking for from like a labor market perspective and data around that, you could look to the Labor Market Information Council, it's called the LMIC. Because uh, I know over the last several years, the federal government has invested heavily in understanding the connection between skills acquired at the, P uh, skills acquired at the PSC level and transitions into the labor market, the whole uh, education to skills connection. So you could look at the LMIC, the federal government's uh, funded, you know, the Future Skills Center, uh, and the Future Skills Center works with like the Conference Board of Canada, uh, Conference Board of Canada. There's uh, and several other agencies that are connected with that funding that are talking about in demand skills that employers are looking for. Um, and we also, I mean, it depends. And we also have uh, reports that we've put out that look at the labor market outcomes of multi-credential students. So students that take multiple credentials, that's more high level. It's not pinpointing the precise skills, uh, but yeah, feel free to send us a, an email, but those are some suggestions for places to look at. Uh, and they're developing systems where uh, the sector can go in and look, like even students can go in and enter a potential path, like a career that they're looking at. Uh, and these, uh, these like search engines will provide information to the students about potential careers that satisfy like what, what education they would require, what skills they would require for certain professions. So yeah, I would look at LMIC, Future Skills Center. Those are some suggestions off the top of my head. I see Adrian has her hand up as well. Yeah, you're welcome. Everybody, um, thanks. That just to supplement, there is a. It, sorry, I'm the uh, executive director of ONCAT. Prior to at ONCAT, I was at George Brown College, and I had new program development in my portfolio. And there was a tool that we used on labor labor market um, prediction, because of course that's the holy grail when you're developing programs. You want to make sure there's going to be jobs for your students. So we used something called Burning Glass. It's um, it, it was okay. It wasn't perfect. It's an analytic. Um, and they, they crawl all job postings and then and you get a report of like, there are X number, there are a lot of, there's big demand for meat packers in Southern Ontario. So you get this, you know, there's X number of jobs. It's not predictive. It's just, it's telling you current state, but there are more and more sophisticated tools around that for labor market um, to really identify labor market needs. And then you can you know, backfill and figure out what that appropriate program is to meet, uh, academic program is to meet that need. It's just a lot of exalt around the timing. You don't, it's not future forecasting, but uh, it might be worth looking at if you're, uh, if you're examining those things. Awesome. 
Thank you so much. Um, we are running out of time. So I know um, Anna and Rod maybe had a few last things they wanted to share. And then I just wanted to plug our next Lunch and Learn. So please take it away. Yeah, so again, I think we just wanted to, uh, a couple pieces. One, uh, if it's not on most of your radars, although it's exciting to see a lot of uh, folks who can work with that, ONCAT does have a variety of funding opportunities available uh, to support pathway development, um, to support institutions specifically to look at their transfer capacity, whether, and an important one is our data pilot, which supports you to actually assess transfer student outcomes at your institution um, and other projects and that we're very, uh, we kind of operate in a kind of collaborative high engagement way. So if you have project ideas and you want to discuss those with myself or Rod, uh, Carolyn, other team members, um, do reach out to us. We're always happy to kind of hear earlier about what you're thinking, what are you working on at your institution or, you know, across the field in terms of uh, pathways for students or transfer student support strategies. Uh, so just an invitation to reach out to us to discuss project ideas. Um, and then I also just wanted to flag, you may have received or kind of through tag net, uh, networks or um, kind of uh, through my colleague Ina, an invitation. There's an information session next week on Friday for a tool, Pathway AI, which is kind of an online credit assessment tool um, that uses AI to help do some of the kind of um, course mapping when you're looking at developing pathways. And so just an invitation, if you're interested in learning more about that tool uh, to join us for um, that session, it'll be Lakehead University facilitating it. So it's a great chance to, yeah, just learn a little bit more. Uh, and then if you or your institution is interested in kind of testing it out, um, they will be doing kind of, um, yeah, kind of piloting it with several institutions. And yeah, I will, let me just dig up the, yeah, why don't you pop the that in the link. chat? That'll be helpful. Yeah, awesome. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think this was a really fruitful session. Um, I just wanted to uh, let you know that next month, so August, yeah, the fourth Wednesday in August, we'll be hearing from Victoria Baker from Seneca College and Heather O'Leary from the University of Waterloo on um, our second part of the pathway series, which will go into the preparation that you need to do to build a transfer pathway, either as an articulation agreement or a policy at your institution. So keep an eye out for that on our SharePoint site. And last but not least, please also make sure to fill out our post event survey. Um, it's really helpful to get your feedback on what you'd like to learn for future sessions. And as well as you know, getting a sense of how the timing is working since we did expand this session a bit um, based on feedback we received in the past. So please make sure to fill that out. Um, you'll be entered to win an Amazon gift card uh, in that one, okay? Um, sorry for sounding so rushed, but uh, another great session with all of you um, and really looking forward to seeing you again next month. So thanks a lot, enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone.